folks, and welcome to the screencast in which we talk about energy flow through ecosystems. We want to know how organisms get their energy. You may know that all organisms need energy to run the chemical reactions within their bodies. So we're really interested in how this energy enters an organism from the ecosystem. One important concept to really get from this is that energy flows through an ecosystem. That is, it's captured for a brief period of time and transferred from one organism to another. But it never stays in one place for very long. Eventually, all of the energy that comes into an ecosystem leaves in the form of heat. You see, the nature of energy is to keep moving, and an ecosystem can't hold on to it for very long. It needs a constant input of energy, and therefore, there's a constant output of energy. So how do animals get their food? Well, you might know that animals get their food by eating plants, plant products, or other animals. That's easy enough. You learned that a long time ago. Plants get their energy by the process of photosynthesis. They use sunlight and convert air and water into food. A little bit more on photosynthesis later on. But let's get back to the source of energy. Sunlight is the main source of energy for most life on Earth. Qualifying word there is most, not all life. And I'll address that in a second. Organisms are divided into two groups based on how they obtain their energy in an ecosystem. In an ecosystem we have either autotrophs that make their own food by converting energy and chemicals into food, or we have heterotrophs. They must eat other organisms for their food. The prefix hetero means different, and the suffix trough means to eat. So to define what a heterotroph really is, literally means to eat other organisms. So let's look at some autotrophs. The best known autotrophs are those that harness the power of the sun through photosynthesis. They use this energy to convert carbon dioxide, which is in the air, and water into oxygen and glucose. Glucose, as you might remember, is a carbohydrate. It's the simplest food source for an organism. It's what your cells can use to make energy. All land plants, including trees, shrubs, and other herbs, are autotrophs. Seaweed and algae are autotrophs, and even some bacteria are autotrophs. Any autotroph that converts sunlight, carbon dioxide, and water into an energy source would be considered a photosynthetic autotroph. But those aren't the only autotrophs. We also have some autotrophs that can take chemicals from seawater and convert that into a an, a fuel source. Deep within the ocean, far away from any sunlight, is a type of bacteria that, using the heat from volcanic vents and sulfur chemicals that are coming out of the volcanic vents, convert that into a fuel source. Any organism, or these bacteria, are called chemosynthetic autotrophs. Now in the picture that you see there, you see these volcanic vents called black smokers. The water is extremely hot there. These chemosynthetic organisms start the food chain for an entire ecosystem many miles deep within the ocean where sunlight can't reach. The long squiggly things that you see in the left -hand bottom left-hand corner are tube worms. Other organisms such as fish and crustaceans like crabs will eat those, setting up an entire food chain. So there's, there are ecosystems and places where you wouldn't expect them. Now, if you're not an autotroph, you're a heterotroph. That is, you must get your energy from another source, that is, by eating it. And we can classify heterotrophs into a number of different groups. We have herbivores that obtain their energy by eating plants. Carnivores eat only animals. Omnivores can eat both. And then another group called detritivores. These feed on the remains of dead plants and animals. Decomposers are considered a type of detritivore. Detritivores are certain types of insects that you might find living in the soil or under logs. Decomposers are typically your bacteria or fungi that live in the soil. And they're the real recyclers. They're sort of the end of the food chain. They get the last bits of energy out of any organic material. And ecosystems also depend on decomposers to return any nutrients back to the soil so that they can be used again by the 
autotrophs. So you may start seeing a relationship here between the autotrophs and the heterotrophs other than just energy flow. We'll investigate different types of herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores in the different environments, in the different ecosystems that we study. Each ecosystem has to have an autotroph and typically has several heterotrophs within it. And these organisms set up what we call a food chain. Here are two typical food chains. One's a terrestrial food chain, meaning that it's a food chain in a land ecosystem, and then a marine food chain which exists in the ocean. Now a food chain is a series of steps in a community of organisms that is used to transfer energy and matter by eating or being eaten. The steps or the different levels are called trophic levels. Remember the word trophic means eating. So in this case these are different eating levels. And so the food chain always starts off as we said with primary producers. That's the first trophic level. Primary consumers are the next trophic level. And these are your herbivores and some omnivores can occupy the primary consumer position. Secondary consumers are your omnivores or carnivores. Anything that eats a secondary consumer is called a tertiary consumer. The word tertiary means third. And in some ecosystems, you can even have a quaternary consumer, the fourth level. It's not very common that you go past the quaternary level. This is easy enough to understand. But within an ecosystem, the feeding relationships are a little bit more complicated than a food chain. What we need to look at are food webs. Food webs are a series of interconnected food chains. See, a heterotroph eats more than just one other type of organism in the environment. Notice in the, in the food web, we start off with the arrows down at the lowest trophic level. And the arrow always goes from the food source to the organism being eaten. So if you were to construct one of these your, yourself, the direction of the arrows is very important. Again, it goes from the food source to the organism that's eating it. Can you still identify the trophic levels here? Here's another example of a food web that has the decomposers in it. And so this one is a little bit more detailed than the others. This would be a terrestrial food web that you could find around here. Again, can you find the different trophic levels? So here are some concepts and definitions that you want to be sure that you understand. Energy flows through an ecosystem in one direction, from the sun or inorganic compounds to autotrophs or producers, and then to various heterotrophs, which are considered consumers. Food chains are a series of steps in which organisms transfer energy by eating or being eaten. And food webs show the complex interactions within an ecosystem. Each step in a food chain or web is called a trophic level. Producers make up the first step and consumers make up the higher levels. But exactly how much energy is transferred from one level to the next? Well, in order to understand that, scientists have put together these energy pyramids, or otherwise known as ecological pyramids. It's a diagram that shows the relative amounts of energy or matter contained within each trophic level in a food web or food chain. The first kind of ecological pyramid is an energy pyramid, which shows that only 10% of the energy available within one trophic level is transferred to, the, to organisms at the next level. Here's a short video from my friend Stella, where she describes energy pyramids and, the, and how much energy is transferred. So energy is passed on through food webs and chains. But how much is passed on? But if we use this spot of sunlight to represent the sun's light energy shining on a green plant, how much does the plant manage to convert to stored food energy? 66 percent. Thirty-three percent. Fact: This much, zero point two percent. Only one five hundredth of the sun's light energy is transferred to the start of a food chain. 
So if all the energy that's stored in the plant and is available to the animals that eat it is represented by this light, how much is transferred to that animal? 90%? 50%? No, the amount of energy transferred to the animals is around 10%. What happens to the 90% that isn't? Well, it's not available to the food chain because it's the energy the plant needs each and every day to survive. And it's the energy that drives all the reactions to make new cells, which in turn produces leaves, flowers, and seeds. In fact, all levels of the food chain only transfer 10% of the energy they receive onto the next level. So as the energy is passed on from one level to the next, only 10% of it is available to the next level. Here we actually use some numbers. Down here, for example, if a producer has within it a thousand kilocalories of energy, the primary consumers will only get 10% of that, a hundred kilocalories. Remember Stella asked what happened to 90% and then she explained, well, that 90% is used by the organism that was eaten in order to run its chemical reactions and to build its cells. Primary consumers get 100 kilocalories, therefore secondary consumers get 10 kilocalories, and then the top tertiary consumer gets one kilocalorie. Now if you were to take a, a survey of the population of each of these organisms at the different trophic levels, of course you would find that at the top trophic level there are fewer organisms because, quite frankly, the ecosystem just doesn't have enough energy within it to support many of those top consumers. Another way to draw this energy pyramid is this way, through what's called a numbers pyramid. This shows the number of organisms that can be supported at each trophic level. For example, in an oak tree with 15,000 leaves could support 1,100 caterpillars, which could support 30 blue tit birds and only one hawk. And yet another type of pyramid is called the biomass pyramid in which it measures the amount of mass of each organism at each trophic level. A thousand kilograms of grass or vegetation could support a hundred kilograms of herbivores which can support 10 kilograms of a primary consumer and only one kilogram of a top carnivore or or a tertiary consumer in this in this case. All three of those pyramids are simply just a different way of looking at the amount of energy and matter that can support each trophic level. So in conclusion, energy pyramids show the amount of food energy available to each trophic level from the one below it. Biomass pyramids show the total amount of living food available at each trophic level and the numbers pyramid shows the number of individuals needed to support the next level. Because each trophic level harnesses only about one-tenth of the energy from the level below, it can support only one-tenth of the amount of living tissue. What happened to the 90% that is not transferred to the next level? It is not transferred because it's the energy used by the organism to run all the chemical reactions of life and to build new cells. And finally, to understand what happens to all of this energy as it's being used, it's eventually converted into heat energy. And that heat energy leaves the ecosystem and travels away and eventually into outer space where it's no longer used by life. As long as there's a constant input of energy, this whole system works just fine. So that's it for our concept of energy flow through an ecosystem. I hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, make sure you bring them back to class and we'll discuss them there.